XPS is not a bulk analysis technique. If you look in any literature, it's called a surface analysis technique. It gives you chemical analysis, very neatly, of the top <laughs> outer 10 nanometers. That's about 30 atomic layers. And it's considerably different most of the time to the bulk because the sample's been exposed to some solution, been exposed to the air, some samples are very reactive, and so you get a different chemical composition on the outer surface than you do into the bulk. Here's a few things, 10 Armstrongs, one nanometer. We look at about uh, 10 nanometers, about 100 Armstrongs. Quite different from the x-ray techniques of the microscope where we're looking at one to five microns down. Now there's many surface analysis techniques. You go into the literature you'll probably see 20 or 30 techniques. SAM, scanning Auger, secondary ion mass spectrometry, atomic force microscopy, etc, etc. I think by far the most important is XPS earlier referred to as ESCA, Electron Spectroscopy for Chemical Analysis. Uh, why is it so important? Very easy uh, elemental identification, down to about one in a thousand. No questions asked. Reasonably quantitative, and this is something that not too many other techniques are capable of in a short time is you measure the binding energy of these electrons and it gives you the chemistry of the elements. What the oxidation state is. For example, whether it's sulphur, sulphur 2, sulphur 4, or whether it's copper 0, copper 1, copper 2. This is in some cases not easily seen, requires a bit of processing with this um, XPS processing software. And in general, it's non-destructive. Some organic polymers, fluorinated polymers, are a little damaged with time during XPS analysis. A little history. People, some people are not aware that Einstein won the Nobel Prize in 1921, not for relativity and other physical phenomena, but for the photoelectric effect. Photons in, electrons out the kinetic energy of which is related to the input energy. And it was in 1950s that this chap and his group at Uppsala University developed a technique. They referred to it as ESCA, electron spectroscopy, and they spent many years publishing information. In fact, I've got here a book I picked up at Indrapilly Shopping Town it's a summary of all their papers in the 1950s on the first publications on X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. It was $5.95. First instruments appeared in 1969. So it's about 40, 50 years old. Here's a photo of the first instrument of the company that provided us with the, with the instrument we've got. Hewlett Packard were into it in a big way in the 1970s. They made a very, very nice instrument. They pulled out of it and went into computers, printers, photocopiers. Let's see how it works. A very basic process. You have an X-ray source providing the photons. They bombard the surface. It knocks out what we call the photoelectrons they go up into an, el an electron energy analyzer. And the kinetic energy of these electrons is equal to the input energy minus their binding energy. And the electrons only escape from about five or 10 nanometers. So it's very simple. An X-ray source, a sample in here, an electron energy analyzer. What's going on I haven't gone into any big detail now about the theory of it. You can get that in any internet site. But this is briefly what's happening with the electron energy levels. Here's the 1s, the 2s, the 2p, etc., and the valence band. 
the x-rays come in and the energy is transferred to these core level electrons and it causes these to be ejected out of the solid. We not only, these are the photoelectrons, we not only pick them up, but when the atom loses this electron, it has to relax by an electron falling down to fill this vacancy and a close by electron is emitted. It's called an Auger electron, after a Frenchman called Pierre Auger. We pick them up as well. They're a bit of a nuisance sometimes. There's very little use we make of the photoelectrons, of the OJ electrons. Now if you take an element, say gold, atomic number 79, lots of electrons. We have in here the 1s, the 2s, etc. Then we've got the 4s, the 4ps, the 4ds, the 4fs and the 5ds. If we bombard this gold with x-rays of energy over about 1200 eV, out come all these electrons. And here's the electron energy spectrum, or the XPS spectrum of gold. No two elements have the same electronic configuration, so you get a characteristic spectrum. No other element has a spectrum like that. Lead and other elements in a similar position in the periodic table give similar looking spectrums, but their peaks are in different positions. So each element has a specific XPS spectrum and all these are coming from what we call the core level electrons. Now here's an XPS spectrum and you'll see it starts here at high kinetic energy. You pick up the valence band electrons. Some people make use of those. Not common. And then you pick up these core level electrons you pick up some Auger electrons, another core level electron here. And if you look here, this is going along, then it jumps up, and then here, jumps up, there's a step each time. This is because this is due to these electrons that got out deeper down but lost their energy. This is due to these plus these. This is due to these plus these plus these. This is due to these plus these plus these plus these. Plus these. So you get a step background in most spectrums. The result of electrons getting out deeper down that bumped into each other and lost their uh, energy. You say, well, why is it surface sensitive? People say to me, how deep does the probe go? Now the probe goes at deep microns, hundreds of microns into the sample. The x-rays are very penetrating, just like medical x-rays. 40 keV, they go right through your, um, your flesh. The x-rays we use have a low kinetic energy. The, the x-rays we use have an energy only of about 1200 eV. So these electrons that come out have a low kinetic energy. And their mean free path is only about 3 nanometers. So these electrons close to the surface get out with their original energy. Electrons deeper down here bump into each other and still get out and they provide this background. Not interested in those, we're interested in the ones that got out with their original energy. They only escape from about three mean free parts, about 90 Armstrongs. Most of them come from one mean free part. So if you talk about how deep are we getting information from, 63% of the signal will come from one mean free path, 86.6 um, will come from two, and the total amount will come from something like three mean free paths. So we're talking about 10 nanometers maximum. That's not microns, it's nanometers, about 30 atomic layers. So contamination, other things with the sample exposed to are very important. If you compare it to the microscope techniques, SEM and EDEX, this is not to scale, but this is one micron, down here many floors. These are X-rays coming out. We're talking about electrons coming from 30 to 100 Armstrongs. 
totally different scale to here. So what you might get here might be heavily overcoming what's really on the top here. We get information on what's right on the top here. Now how does it work? Here's a basic XPS diagrammatic drawing of a X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. You have an X-ray source. Modern X-ray machine modern machines have a monochromator. I'll show you why in a minute. X-rays bombard the sample. Photoelectrons come off through a lens system and through an electron energy analyzer where they strike a detector and you get a spectrum. This is the heart of the machine and all of this of course is in an ultra high vacuum. Most machines use a, what they call a CHA, concentric hemispherical analyzer, two spheres. It's only shown in two dimensions here. And here's the instrument we have in the lab. Here's the big hemispheres. Here's the monochromator. Here's all the vacuum chamber and sample introduction system. Cost around one and a half million dollars. Uh, samples get inserted right into this, uh, into the middle here of the, of the vacuum system. X-rays bombard, photoelectrons come off and go through this analyzer. The X-ray source is important. As I said earlier, Hewlett Packard had a very nice machine because in 1973, they had a monochromated X-ray source on their first machine, the first people to introduce it. And what do I mean by a monochromated source? Here's a conventional X-ray source. You bombard a target with high energetic electrons, anything from one to 40 keV, and it gives off electrons. Most of the energy is lost as heat. 96% is lost as heat. Only about 4% goes into X-ray production. So it's a very inefficient process. Here's a typical X-ray source that's got a monochromator. Again, an electron beam striking an aluminium target. X-rays go up through a monochromator and this gets rid of the X-rays we don't want bombarding the sample. We want the X-rays to be as monoenergetic as possible. The more monoenergetic the X-rays, the sharper the peaks. So if you look in some literature and look at data, I can immediately say whether it's been done with a conventional X-ray or a monochromatic X-ray. And this is what the X-ray spectrum looks like. This is a typical X-ray spectrum. You've got the main peaks, the K-alphas and the K-alpha 2s, the K-betas and this Bremsstrahlen radiation. These will all end up giving you background and satellite peaks. We want to get rid of all of that, put it through the monochromator and only select this. In fact, we select the inner part of that. Very sharp energy. We use aluminium K-alpha 1486.6. Now here's a spectrum of silicon. We'll see some spectrums in a minute. This is a silicon 2P photoelectron spectrum from silicon. This is what's been done with a non-monochromated source and look how much better the resolution is with the monochromated source. The width of the peak here is only 0.3, here it's about 2 EV. So we're always after this. Two things we're after, sensitivity and resolution. By far you like to use, if you've got it, the monochromated X-ray source. Now this is important. If you're looking at the XPS spectrums, you'll pick up peaks from the S orbitals, the P orbitals, the D orbitals and the F orbitals. Now the S orbitals, the peaks are not split. In the P, D and F, they're split. And you say, why are they split? It is referred to as spin orbit coupling. You've got the electrons going around like this with an angular momentum. You've got them with a spin momentum and there's an interaction between them. We won't go into the details. You can work it all out. And if we look now at the spectrums, 
of say titanium and sulfur and chromium these are the 2p electrons they're split in the ratio 2 is to 1 and with oxygen 1s and carbon 1s and nitrogen we just get single peaks now if we go up in atomic number to indium 10 and this group the main electrons are the 3d they're also split and they're split in the ratio 3 is to 2 and if you go up to gold and lead and tungsten and all these other ones again you get two peaks they're split and they're in the ratio 4 is to 3 that's how you tend to identify what element you've got not only the binding any position but you must have this if you've got tin you must have these two F's if you've got gold here's a good example again this is the spectrum of pure gold binding energy here number of electrons no other element has a spectrum like this here's the 4F electrons they're split in the ratio 4 is to 3 here's the 4Ds they're split in the ratio 3 is to 2 and here's the 2Ps they're split in the ratio 2 is to 1 and here's the 4S not split and when we do XPS most sample surfaces are slightly insulating even if you give me a very clean piece of metal it's been exposed to the atmosphere it'll have several monolayers of oxides, hydroxides and even some worldly junk as I call now when you do this XPS and the X-rays come in and the electrons come out if the sample is an insulator it'll charge up if it's a nice clean really clean metal there's enough electrons coming from the conductivity of the material to replace the charge now we've got to get rid of this charge if we want to get nice neat XPS spectrums polymers are a typical one if you don't have a neutralizer you won't get a very nice spectrum at all and we neutralize the surface by bombarding it with low energetic electrons now the thing is designed such that it actually overcompensates you don't try just to neutralize it but it gets bombarded with sufficient that it overcompensates and it actually goes a little negative so all the peaks when you take a spectrum most of the time are downscale about 3 EV and you have to charge correct them this is something that when you look in the literature and you see a discrepancy be a small discrepancy by one person's values of binding energy and another it could be related to their charge correction now here's the simplest XPS spectrum you'll see this is polystyrene from one of these cups carbon 1s XPS does not pick up hydrogen the only element it won't pick up so we pick up the carbon 1s very flat for a while we pick this is the valence band electrons then up we go and this background is due to these electrons that escape deeper down but manage to get out and eventually they die away here at low kinetic energy OJ peak for carbon is off scale here we pick that up Now most samples we look at have carbon on the surface in polymers it's there in the bulk in most samples exposed to the atmosphere have some level of carbon and we use this species for the reference now for polymers it's very well established at 285.0 EV now for junk landing on top of oxides and metals there's a quite a variation and people need to state what you've used in any publication as the charge correction reference they say carbon 1s of adventitious carbon was used at 284.8 that's important if they don't put that in well you you know they could be using this they could be using 285 
and there could be a 0.6 EV difference. Now here's that same high resolution carbon 1S spectrum taken from that polystyrene. It was coming in here, about 281.8. And with the software we need to shift it up here. I have to add 3.2 to give it the charge corrected absolute value of 285. And you shift all the peaks the same. You don't shift carbon and then shift oxygen shift them all the same. We'll be doing that in the second half. It's very important. I've seen some people publish uncharged corrected data and it is so confusing. I don't know how it gets past the reviewers. Carbon's coming in at 282. No carbon's come in there. Yes. Now this is an important for those as you are become all users sample preparation. It doesn't have to be smooth. You can give me a powder that's just coarse, that's okay. The smoother the sample, the stronger the spectrum. If you've got a thin film on glass, that gives you stronger signals than a, uh, some powder that you've crushed up. Now do not handle the samples. Don't put your fingers on them or keep them as clean as you can because the information's only coming from a hundred Armstrong. Now for fa powders, the finer the better. Someone bought me a sample yesterday, I immediately said, you look, are you interested in the bulk of the surface? As soon as he said, oh, I wanted the bulk, I want to know, I crushed it up. Because crushing the sample is it made it nice and clean, exposed a lot of clean surfaces. Hopefully it's not going to contaminate too readily before it gets into the ultra high vacuum. So crushing a sample will give you nice fresh and more closely re resemble the bulb. Now typical data acquisition, you say, well, uh, it's not like a microscope. I can't go in and look at one nanometer size particle. Typically the area we're looking at is about 700 by 300 microns. That's the max. I can shut off apertures and go down to 27 microns. Rarely do that. It's in a, a ballpark of no interest to most people. They want to go right down into the nanometers or right up here. So we're getting an average of many, 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 many particles. And what we take is what's called a survey or wide scan. Over 1200 to naught EV. And you can identify all the elements present down to about one in a thousand. This only takes about two or three minutes. So any unknown someone gives me, I can put it in and tell immediately. It's got sodium, chlorine, sulfur, this and this and this and that. Then you go in and do what's called high resolution scans. These are only about 14 EV over the main elements of interest. These take about 10 minutes an element a lot more involved in that and you don't take that data unless you're interested in doing it. So here we are with the surveys they're done at what's called an analyzer pass energy of 160. If you read in the literature they'll say that. Survey scans were taken at pass energy 160, 1 EV steps and something like that. Then you do the high resolution ones they're done at a pass energy of 20 EV but they give you much weaker signals because there's always this trade-off with all spectroscopies. You can't have high sensitivity and high resolution. You have high sensitivity, poor resolution. You go the other way and they cross over. So if you go here and want to pick up all the elements present, do a survey scan and you can pick up one down to one in a thousand very quickly. If you want to look at the chemistry, you tend to look at the chemistry of the major elements there. A lot more time's needed to spend on something that's very weak. So the survey scans can tell you quickly what elements are there, how much, and some quick information about the binding energy. If I see sulphur in a survey scan, I can tell whether it's a sulphide or a sulphur or whether it's a sulphate. Don't have to go in and take this high resolution scans and a lot of data processing. 
And when we do this high resin, this is done, as I said, to look carefully at the chemistry of the elements present. Only done on the major elements. And don't collect this data unless you're prepared to spend the time processing the data. Some people say, I want a survey, I want all this high resolution. I come back a week later and say, let me see what you got last time. Oh, I don't know how to process it. I don't. So it's, most of the time, the survey scan can tell you a lot. And as I said, processing this high resolution data, we'll do that after morning tea. We'll do four samples, show you the basics of how to do it. It takes time and, and requires a pretty good understanding of XPS. You've got to read the literature and get familiar with doing it by self-training. And you need this a bit of an experience, which only comes by using it and asking me and saying, look, I'm trying to do this. And why have I got this? We'll look at some data now before we finish. This is a typical what my machine sees of a very clean piece of copper. Highly polished, been soxalate extracted, put it into the XPS machine, it looks like this if it's been exposed to the air. It'll, any clean metal has a very high surface free energy, it doesn't want to stay that way, so immediately water vapour and oxygen bang, form oxides, hydroxides, and also what jumps on the surface are any hydrocarbon. I call this worldly junk. I think uh, literature referred to it as adventitious carbon. So if I do XPS, I'm really taking XPS of probably about that much. 20 atomic layers. Let's look at the spectrum. Here's the survey spectrum. Here's the copper peaks. These are copper rouge peaks I haven't labelled. Lots of oxygen, lots of carbon, even a little bit of chlorine. It's probably come from the atmosphere, some chlorinated hydrocarbon. So immediately I can say, this is not clean. If it was really clean there, that wouldn't be present. That wouldn't be present. Now I can go in and say, well, let me find out something about the chemistry of the copper the chemistry of the oxygen and the chemistry of the carbon. And here's the high resolution spectrum. See, this has only gone over 970 down to 920 of the copper 2Ps. I've got many peaks there. You can see they're typically in the ratio 2 is to 1 because they're 2Ps. Here's the oxygen 1S and here's the carbon 1S. And if I look closely and do some curve fitting, I pick up copper oxides, hydroxides, some strongly absorbed water, and here's the chemistry of the carbon. This is the carbon-carbon. All these are carbon-oxygens. In this case, I may not necessarily be interested in all resolving all this, but I certainly need this peak to charge correct. And if I look at the copper, this is copper from copper zero, 932.6. This is copper from copper two oxide. So I'm already seeing both the copper oxide and I'm seeing the copper underneath and I'm seeing all the junk and all the oxygen on the surface. Now this binding energy, you might say, well, why does the binding energy change? Uh, if you look at an atom with the electrons going around, there's a potential on the nucleus, repelling electrons. There's the valence electrons uh, here, and it's a balance between this and this. But when you change these valence electrons, it's like adding another electron. It has an effect because this potential goes up and this binding energy changes. We won't go into details. It's not worth it in this brief introduction. And this is what happens with the binding energy shift. If you take sulphur, let's say sulphur comes in, this is oxidation state zero, sulphur. Let's assume it's zero. If we look at sulphides, they're minus 1.4. If we look at sulphates, they're way up here, plus. 
and here's the same with tellurium. If you look at tellurium oxide or tellurium sulfate, this is the binding energy shift relative to the elemental state. And that's what XPS can tell you. And here's tables. I put together a table of carbon. Carbon's come in around 285. If you've got a carbon close to this carboxyl group, it's shifted a little bit. COs are shifted about one and a half. C, this is around 288. If you go way up to CF2, 292, very strong bond between the carbon, as in Teflon. And CF3 is around 294. So this is the binding energy shift of the carbon 1S. Important table. And here's the binding energy shift of the oxygen 1S. These come in around 531. Metal oxides around here and all the rest in the middle. Oxygen in general is not a good one. There's not a big change in shift and it's not so easy to resolve the oxygen 1S. Let's look at a typical spectrum. This is from PET, drink bottle, polyethylene terephthalate. Here's the chemical structure. Atomic concentration, it comes up in atom percent. I shouldn't have this here. This is due from some additive used during processing. It's not much, it's 0 0.8, 8 in a thousand atoms. I can easily see it. Now this is the structure. Now looking at the survey, here's the OJ peaks of the oxygen uh, and here's the OJ peaks uh, of the carbon. And here is the spectrum. If we look here, we can get the chemistry of all this carbon and the chemistry of all this oxygen. Here's the high resolution spectrum of the carbon. Now we've got carbons bound to carbons, we've got carbons bound to oxygens, we've got carbons with two oxygens. This is the binding energy shift. So here's the chemistry related to the molecular structure of the polymer. And if you go into the oxygen, we've got two oxygens in the ratio one is to one. Because there's one of those, for each one of those, there's one of those. So this is the chemistry of the oxygen. In the ratio one is to one. Now I have in the lab uh, a very good book. It's called The XPS of Polymers, of High Resolution XPS of Polymers. It's a database of most polymers. Very good set of spectra for polymers and any organic material. If you're looking for reference, where would this nitrogen come in? You tend to find a, a polymer that might have a similar type of functional group there. Now here's a, try to get across this surface. These are silicon wafers. This is uh, seven ninths pure, 99.999% pure silicon. Here's the XPS spectrum. What's the biggest peak there? Oxygen. And this, here's all the silicon peaks. This is because on the surface of here is about 15 Armstrongs of silicon oxide. This is telling me I'm only really looking at about you know, 50 or 100 Armstrong. And if I like, I can have a look at the chemistry of the silicon. And here's the chemistry of the silicon. This is what the surface looks like. That's what, you can't see it on there, there's only 15 Armstrongs. From this information, I can tell you it's 15 by the ratio of this peak to this peak. So this is the elemental silicon. We're looking at the two P's. They're split. They're in the ratio two is to one. We're looking at silicon oxide. That's this little peak here. So if the oxide got thicker, this would get thicker and th this would get smaller. Until if I got about 100 Armstrongs of oxi oxide, I wouldn't see this peak. Okay, so this is how you can work. We can work out the thicknesses of thin layers on highly polished materials like this. Used a lot in the semiconductor industry. They're very keen on the thickness of this uh, oxide. Now you might say, look, I've heard of iron beam cleaning. Why don't you clean off all this rubbish? 
with an iron gun. I've got on the system an argon iron gun which can be used for cleaning. It's like an atomic milling machine. I can get rid of a few nanometers of junk by bombarding it with argon ions and sputtering them away and then having a look in here. But that's okay, but it tends to only apply if you're after elemental information. People with multi layers of thin films, you can profile that and see the change and the thicknesses of the layers. But don't be looking at the chemistry because this is very destructive. For example, here's a tungsten oxide. This is a, not tungsten oxide on metal, it's thick tungsten oxide powder. And here's the spectrum, here's the tungsten 4Fs and etc. etc. And there's quite a lot of carbon. In fact, there's 42 atom percent. Out of 100 atoms, 42 are carbon. I can give it a clean for five minutes and I reduce it down to 9 atom percent. So that's good. Now let's have a look at our chemistry. But look what happens. Here's the tungsten 4F spectrum, very neat, telling me the binding energy here that it's tungsten oxidation state. Uh, six and after etching five minutes this is what I've done to the chemistry I've broken all this down there's still a little bit left these are all other oxidation states W2 all the way down to the metal I've actually formed metal on the surface of the oxide by the iron bombardment so I'm not interested in doing cleaning up your samples and then looking at the chemistry now we'll finish off with, this was a very interesting example and really shows you the powerfulness of XPS. Um, Teflon potentially is a good biomaterial, put in your body, it's inert. Uh, however, the surface needs to be modified so that cells and stuff can attach to it. And if you take the spectrum of pure Teflon, here it is, very nice spectrum. Lots of fluorine, fluorine OJs, carbons, that's all that's in it. This is Teflon, CF2. Here, this material called MOEP has been attached to the Teflon. The first thing you do is say, let's have a survey scan and see if we've got any of this material there. And here's the survey scan. If I've got this material there, I say, well, I should have a, quite a bit of carbon, a little bit of phosphorus, lots of oxygen. Here they are. I've got extra carbon here, see this one? And I've got a little bit of phosphorus. This is only a monolayer or so, maybe one monolayer, attached to the Teflon. But if I want to confirm the attachment and say, is the chemistry still there or is it just junk and something else, I need to go in and look at the high resolution spectrum of all these elements. If I go into the fluorine, this is before the Teflon and this is after grafting. No change because the fluorine's not involved. Now let's have a look at the carbon. Wow! Here's the carbon, binding energy 292, that's the CF2, and here's all the carbons from here. Remember this is one molecular layer and we can see the carbon carbons here. We can see the carbon oxygens. We can see this group, the carbon with two oxygens. We can even see in here with fitting, and this is a bit broad that there's actually a carbon bound to the fluorine now. We've lost one fluorine. Here's the CF2. So it's not very thick. If this was very thick we wouldn't see any of that. And if you go into the oxygen, wow, this is complex too. This is where you need to have your fitting and data processing ability to resolve this. There's one, two, three, four different oxygen species. There's these oxygens bound to the phosphorus. There's oxygen singly bound to the carbon. There's oxygen doubly bound to the carbon. And the phosphorus, you say, well, there's two species there. And you say, hold on. With the phosphorus, we're looking at the 2P. We don't look at the 1S, we look at the 2P. 
and this is the splitting in the ratio 2 is to 1. So there's only one type of phosphorus there. There's many types of oxygen and there's many types of carbon. We'll finish off and have a break for morning tea. In summary, we have a probe, an X-ray beam. Can't be focused very much, the beam's about two millimetres or so. Very difficult to focus X-rays. And we use aluminium K-alpha. 1486.6. Now that's more than enough energy to knock out most core level electrons. Some machines, older ones, have magnesium x-rays. I've got a magnesium source as well. Never use it if you've got this. It's like having a modern car with, you know, power steering, power and brakes. You don't go back and use the, the old one. If this broke down, I'd, I'd change to this one. They wouldn't be nicely resolved. I'd have little satellite peaks. I'd have bigger backgrounds. It's not as neat. You tend to always want to use this monochromated aluminium. What do we look at? We look at the photoelectrons and the Auger electrons. They only come from two to ten atomic layers. By far, this is the most important part. It gives you very easy, quantitative and extensive chemical on any vacuum compatible solid. Material can't be too volatile. If you put it in the vacuum, it'll disappear. If I put a piece of sulphur in the, there and a piece of sticky tape, put it into, pump it down, put it into the main analyzer chamber, it's all gone because it's so volatile. The vapor pressure at room temperature is rather high. This is the major disadvantage of XPS. Okay? Its nano resolution is in the Z direction not the X and Y. So I can't go in and have a look at, you know, 100 nanometer particle and give you an analysis. We typically we look at 700 by 300 microns. That gives us maximum sensitivity. We can go down to 27 microns. You lose a lot of sensitivity. Semiconductor industry like to go down into small areas. They, they used a lot on bond pad failures, etc. Here's some good sites. In the note too, you'll find lots of useful information in, in these sites.